benedictions come lay them down at the foot of the cross jesus is waiting god so loved the world
Morning, church. How we doing? We doing good. I like that. Uh, I am never disappointed uh, what uh, is available to uh, people like myself and the AV team um, in, in terms of resources. They seem to capture um, just at the right time, at the right moment, um, the messages that, that I feel God has put on, uh, on my heart to share with you today. So, I want to start with a quote, as I normally do. Whatever happened to you, Roy? Response, my life didn't turn out as I had expected. This from a quote from one of my favorite movies, The Natural, um, starring Robert Redford, where Roy Hobbs is this all-star slugger that started out his life on a certain path. That Roy Hobbs had expectations of being great. If you're just joining us, we're here working through a series entitled Shaken. And for the past several weeks, we've had the opportunity to connect with certain characters in the Bible. And without, with the help of the Holy Spirit, we've had the blessings of putting ourselves into the context of the stories. And as we continue to be challenged with the New and Old Testament writings, it is my hope that we might observe yet another individual who's had their world turned upside down. An individual that was the herald for the Lord Jesus Christ as he announced his presence and revealed his purpose. I'm talking about no, other, no, no one other than John the Baptist. Everybody remembers John the Baptist. And in typical fashion, I need to ask you a question. Perhaps two questions, if you'll let me. When's the last time you doubted yourself? I want you to think about that for just a minute. Have you ever made plans only to have them crumble right before your very eyes? Well, if you have, we're going to be diving into a, a particular book today, and we're going to be doing something a little bit different. We're going to try to uh, trace John the Baptist as he has, uh, goes through his entire ministry. And so the title of this message I have called, When Our Expectations Don't Match God's Plan. We'll be in the book of Matthew, Matthew 11, verses 1 through 3. We're also going to jump around to 3, chapter 11 and chapter 14, with the thrust of our message coming from verses 1 through 3 in chapter 11. And in the text, we'll see what Christ does in view of our expectations. Next, we'll discover what happens when our expectations don't match God's plan. And then finally, we'll learn how to take a complex principle and simplify it for our daily walk with the Lord. So turn with me, if you will, to the book of Matthew. It's in the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. Remember, this is uh, one of the books told from uh, Matthew's vantage point from the Gospels. And as you're turning there, let me provide you a little bit of background. What do we know about John the Baptist? We know that John was born to Elizabeth and Zechariah, the priest around 7 BC, thanks to the book of Luke. We know that John grew up in the wilderness near Judea and that John is related to the Lord Jesus Christ through a Jew, Jew, Jewish genealogy. Well, what else? Well, we know that John's birth was foretold by an angel who instructed Zechariah to name him John. And if we dig just a little bit deeper, if we spend a little bit more time in the scriptures, we might observe that this has been referred to, and John has been referred to rather, as the forerunner of Christ. And so 30 years later, after Jesus' birth, Matthew picks up an account of Jesus' early ministry in this section where Matthew records this. In those days, John the Baptist came, preaching and teaching in the, wilder or in the wilderness of Judea, and saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. This is he who has spoken through the prophet Isaiah, a voice of one calling in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight paths for him. As we pick up in the text, John is baptizing people in the Jordan for the forgiveness of their sins. And as John overlooks the crowd, he notices a few characters that it's out of place. The Pharisees and the Sadducees. And he has some pretty harsh words for them. And his harsh words are, you brood of vipers, this is what he calls them. Who told you to repent? 
See, the idea of their repentance had to do that they were trying to link their Abrahamic heritage for the forgiveness of their sins. And what John is really telling the crowd is what I'm doing is, is baptizing people for this declaration to step out for, for Christ, to identify with Christ. That is John's purpose for doing it. And so what John is really saying is, I'm unable to, for the person that's coming, Jesus, who's coming, I am, uh, I am not worthy to tie his shoes. But the one that's coming, the one that's going to baptize, the true meaning of baptism, you ain't seen nothing yet. So look with me in the text as we begin. Main point one, we reconnect with God through Jesus. The Bible says in chapter, uh, excuse me, in verse 13, when Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to be baptized by John, but John tried to deter him, saying, I need to be baptized by you. And do you come to me? Verse 15 says, Jesus replied, let it be so now. It is proper for us to do this to fulfill all righteousness, then John consented. Verse 16 says, As soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water, and at the moment heaven was open, and we saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. And the voice from heaven said, This is my Son, whom I love and am well pleased. At years after the silence in Nazareth, Jesus appeared among those listening to John's preaching and presenting himself as the candidate for baptism. Think about that for a second. There was, there was no trumpet. There was no announcing his, uh, uh, his baptism, no parade. He simply fell in line and waited patiently for his turn. And I want us to notice that the, the, the paths of these two main biblical characters, as they intersect, you see uh, Matthew's description here in, in, in 3, uh, is Matthew is decreasing the momentum of the narrative by shedding light on the beginning of Jesus' ministry. And if you remember in chapter 2 of Matthew, Jesus was a child in Galilee. Now we find him grown up and he's made his way south of Judea to partake in a baptism. Let me stop. I want you to think about this for a second. For those of us that understand baptism, or at least the concept of baptism, I want you to think of it like this. Why did Jesus get baptized? Think about that. If baptism is for your stepping out to say, I identify and, and this is who I'm following, and, and John is baptizing for the forgiveness of sins, why did Jesus get baptized? If, if Jesus is God and he is, what is Jesus doing? Have you thought about that for a moment? What's interesting is John struggles with this very notion as well. He recognizes Jesus not just by face, but he recognizes Jesus by who he is and what he represents. So like John, right, John was a little bit confused. Why was Jesus there in the first place? Look at verse 13. Then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to be baptized, but John tried to deter him by saying, I need to be baptized by you. And do you come to me? Can, can you imagine the scene? John, John is like this. John's uh, baptizing people in the Jordan, right? Think of it. At raised to, uh, uh, to, a, to a likeness or a new life. Bless you. And then his eyes capture Jesus, and he says, Jesus, what, what are you doing here, man? Uh, why are you in line? Why are, why are you here to get baptized? You don't need to be baptized. You're God. Why would God need to forgive sin? Matthew doesn't explicitly denunciate the doctrine of Christ sinless. But he seems to hint at it. Remember in verse 11, John has already disclosed his inferior complex in view of who's to come. John's already said, I baptize you in water, but the one who comes who is more powerful than I, I can't even tie his sandals. In this statement, John acknowledges his own sinfulness in comparison to Jesus. And as such, John should be baptizing Jesus rather than the other way around. Do you see that in the text? In other words, John recognizes that Jesus does not fit the requirements for baptism. D does this make sense to any of you? If Jesus is God, don't miss this, the second person of the Godhead, fully God and fully man. Yes? And God said, and God who's never said, this is Hebrews 4, 15 and 1 John 3, 5, then why would he need to be baptized? Have you ever contemplated that for a moment as you read the scriptures? 
Some speculate that Jesus was confessing the sins of the nation as Moses and Ezra and Daniel had done in previous occasions. So why did he? The Bible answers that question. Look with me at verse 15. Jesus replied, let it be so now. It is proper for us to do this to fulfill the righteousness. Jesus' response to John was that he was fulfilling what was right. It was what God wanted him to do. Do, do you guys understand? Are you following with what I'm saying? Let me say it a different way. The law didn't require baptism. Remember, there wasn't a, in the Levitical system, and we were talking a little bit about that today, this morning in group, that in the Levitical system, uh, to make yourself right with God didn't come from baptism. They didn't have baptisms. There was no baptisms. Are we good with that? However, John, John's message was about repentance and for those to make themselves right before the coming Messiah. In other words, people were trying to get themselves right before Jesus came. Are you following me with this? Are you still confused? I see some confused faces. Okay, I'll say it a different way. Let me help you with this. Jesus said, this is to fulfill righteousness, yes? If the Messiah were to provide righteousness for sinners, he must identify with sinners. Jesus was baptized, don't miss this, so that he could identify with us. Jesus didn't come to confess any sins. He came to fulfill all righteousness. To fulfill righteousness means to complete everything that forms from the relationship of obedience to God. In doing this, Jesus identifies and endorses John's ministry as divinely ordained. In short, Jesus was baptized as intended by the Father so that he could relate to us. Does that make sense? You might be asking yourself, why? Why would Jesus do this? Because there's something brewing, friends, behind the backdrop. Something that we can't see. Something that Matthew is, is not able to tell us about, but God knows. In other words, there's a decision that needs to be made about salvation. Jesus came so that we could identify with him now, so that we will also identify with him on, in death, that's on the cross, and so that we might identify with him at the end of our lives. Amen? That's why Jesus got baptized. Folks, John gets this. This is as clear as day to him. You know how I know this? Because the Bible says so. Look at, look at verse 16. Then John consented. As soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up from the water, and the moment heaven was open, he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. Verse 17 says, And a voice from heaven said, This is my Son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Right after, immediately. That's one of the things that, that you hear from Matthew, is, is immediately uh, after John pulls Jesus upwards out of the Jordan, the Bible says, Heaven was opened and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. And a voice of heaven said, This is my Son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. As soon as this is complete... God the Father stamps his approval with the giving of the third person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit, with a confirmation by saying, I am well pleased. The significant observation, folks, don't miss this, about baptism of Jesus was authenticated from heaven. And just right after, listen to me when I say this, look up here, and just at the right time, you have evidence of the Trinity. You know, sometimes we hear that. We don't see the Trinity. We don't see that in the Scriptures. <laughs> I want you to pay attention. You have all the three persons of the Godhead captured right here in Scripture. Look at it. You have the Father, you have the Son, and you have the Holy Spirit all interacting as God. Incredible. Incredible. You're like, wait, what did I, did I miss something? Allow me to backfill a little bit of this. Um, let me move to main point two, and I'll see if I can help you with this. Uh, main point two is God's plan can leave us shaken. The Bible says that after Jesus had finished instructing his 12, we're jumping to uh, Matthew 11 now. Uh, after Jesus had finished interacting with the 12, he went out from there to teach and preach in the towns of Galilee. Verse two says, when John was in prison and heard about the deeds of the Messiah... He sent his disciples to ask him, are you the one who has come or should we expect someone else? Uh, 
as I backfill this, uh, just try to stay with me. Remember, we're tracking John the Baptist. This is not like we normally do. It's not like we go, we take a piece of scripture and we read through it. We're bouncing around in Matthew so that I can try to connect the dots for you. Remember what I said about Jesus records the point of John's Baptist in his ministry. It starts with the winding down of Jesus' ministry being elevated. Matthew's point is to help the reader to see that John's ministry has served its purpose as the forerunner for Christ. So what happens is simply this. In Matthew 4, Matthew records Jesus being tested in the wilderness. He also captures the calling of the disciples and heals the sick. In chapters 5 to 7, he observed the, the Sermon on the Mount where Jesus teaches the principles of the kingdom. In 8 to 9, miraculous healings take place to showcase the power of the king. And in chapter 10 is where the commission of the 12 begin. And so it is, we land on chapter 11 where we pick up in the narrative where John left off with Jesus. Matthew 11, 1 to 2 says, after Jesus had finished instructing the 12, he went from there to teach and preach in the towns of Galilee. We say, okay, so the, the 12 had been set out by Jesus to head to Galilee from Nazareth. Notice the turning point in the narrative in verse 2 when John, who was in prison, prison, excuse me, heard about the deeds of the Messiah. He sent his disciples to ask him, are you the one to come or should we expect someone else? Why is John in prison is probably what you're asking right now. See, when you bounce around from Scripture, uh, sticking with the narrative, you, you, it, it begs the question, how did we get to this point? Why is John arrested? How did we get here? Who arrested John? Remember, if we go back to chapter 4, verse 12, the, uh, the Bible helps track what happens. At some point, the Bible isn't clear of why Jesus, uh, on his way to Capernaum, uh, is preached. But what I can tell you is he gets his word that John has been arrested. Verse 12 says, when Jesus heard that John had been put in prison, he withdrew to Galilee. That's, verse, that's four, chapter 4, verse 12. And when John heard all of what Jesus was doing in the town, he sent his disciples to ask Jesus a profound question. And he asked simply this, Are you the one who has come, or should we expect someone else? Do you see John's dilemma? Can you identify with John at this point? John's shaken at this point, folks. He's trying to re recall how he even arrived at this place. John's a little worried that he's made a mistake along the way, that his expectations didn't line up with the understanding of the plan. Remember, John and Jesus are related. They're cousins. They're cousins. John's whole ministry was all about the announcement of the Messiah, the one, the one who would make all things new, the one who the Scripture foretold, the one who was was the prophecies were told and passed from generation to generation, the one whom all sins would fall upon for the forgiveness of sins would be get forgiven. Folks, John is questioning if his expectation matches the plans of God. He's doubting himself. Let me ask you a question. When's the last time your expectations didn't match up with God's? Have, have you been there before? When's the last time you planned for something to go your way and God stepped in and rearranged your whole world? For some of us, it was a smooth transition. For others, it was painful. Still, some of us are in process of working through what we expected from God. But the Lord asks us to take a different path. This is a, this is a rocky path. Have you been on one before? One that we don't like, where the struggle is real and the hurt oftentimes won't allow us to even get out of bed. Have you been there before? Just struggling to get up for the day. Does God have you, church, going through uncharted waters right now? I mentioned in my previous life, um, I worked in the hospitality industry. Uh, I graduated from the Culinary Institute of America in Hyde Park, New York. Um, my culinary degree took me to a lot of crazy places. Um, Manhattan was one of them, uh, where I worked for, for some time. I then found myself on Capitol Hill. Um, and I worked with some of the top chefs, and as my career credibility grew, so did my ego. One of... The downfalls to success, if you don't already know, if we're not careful, is that sin can slip easily into your life. 
with ego. And with each article written and with, with each accolade and with, with each compliment, my expectations to be one of the, great, the best chefs in the country grew until the Lord got a hold of my heart. And my expectations changed. Slowly, the world that uh, had been provided for me with so much comfort was starting to slip away. Some of you know that story. I knew where I was. I knew where I was going. I, I, I had this idea that my life was going to be perfect, that I, somehow I was going to graduate from, from culinary school, uh, take these jobs in Manhattan and on Capitol Hill, and at some point that my life would continue to take off. Crazy success. Maybe you're there right now where your expectations changed and you were shaken. Maybe this is happening to you. Folks, this is where John the Baptist is. As Matthew lets us in just a little bit more, he asks his disciples to send word and ask Jesus, did I, did I miss something, Jesus? I had life figured out. Why am I sitting in prison? Weren't you the one that we were supposed to remove sin? John is looking for some reassurance and clarification for him. John had expected that the Messiah would come onto the scene and would, would overcome the wickedness of mankind. Not only that, that the Messiah would judge the sins of the sinners and that he would bring in his kingdom. John knows this because that's what he's heard his whole life. Remember, his, his father was a priest. He knew the scriptures. He knew what he was talking about. And now he sits in prison, doubting, questioning. How did I get here? Folks, have you ever been there before where you've doubted yourself? Where you ask yourself as you look back, how on earth did I get to this place? That I had this already figured out. I was on a trajectory to be successful, and then God changed it. The Bible says in Matthew 11, 4 to 6, that Jesus replied, Go back and report to John what you hear and see, that the blind receive sight, the lame walk, those who have leprosy are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the good news is proclaimed to the poor, blessed is anyone who does not stumble, the Bible says, on account of me. Friends, John's looking for a simple yes or no. Jesus, I don't, I don't want to talk in parables. I, I, I just want a simple yes or no. John wants to know if Jesus is the one who he's proclaimed as the Messiah. That's John's desire is to confirm that his expectations of who he thinks Jesus is, is accurate. Jesus, are you the one? That's what he's asking. And look at the Lord's response. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, those who have leprosy are clean, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the good news is proclaimed to the poor. What does Jesus do? Jesus simply points to his works. He answers John's question. Nothing crowning, nothing braggadocious in his reply. In a recounting of his works, Jesus reminds John that the miracles of healing are all the proof needed to reveal the true identity. That Jesus is, in fact, the Messiah. Remarkable. What's more, those that did not miss the true character of the Lord would truly be blessed. Though he would ultimately bring judgment to the world by judging sin when he brought in his kingdom. The timing, folks, is what I want us to pay attention to. The timing is not appropriate. Israel's rejection of him was causing a postponement in establishing a physical blessing. Remember, it, it isn't until chapter 19 to 25 in Matthew's gospel where he presents Jesus as the king. We're on our way there, aren't we? With Easter right around the corner. It's too soon to reveal who Jesus is. Right now, the narrative is building. Right now, Israel's rejecting. Right now, it's not time. 
But you know what, folks? There's a time coming when the King of kings and the Lord of lords will reveal who He is, Jesus Christ, our King. Amen? The one who, as John proclaims, takes away the sins of the world, that if we put our trust in life in the hands of the King, that He will forgive us of our sins and restore us to a right relationship with the Father. But now is not the time. That time's coming. Main point one, we reconnect with God through Jesus. Main point two, God's plan can leave us shaken. Main point three, trust God's plan no matter the cost. Matthew continues with his narrative in chapter 12, which highlights the controversy over the Sabbath, controversy over the signs and the parables in 13, and finally in chapter 14 where Matthew returns the reader as we pick up where we left off. Uh, Matthew 14, 1 through 5, look with me if you will. At the time, Herod the Tetrarch, heard of the reports of Jesus. Remember, we're skipping around, church. And he said to his attendants, this is John the Baptist. He was raised from the dead. That is why the miracle powers are at work in him. Now Herod had arrested John and bound him and put him in prison because of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife. For John was saying to him, it is not lawful for you to have her. Herod wanted to kill John, but he was afraid of the people because he considered John a prophet. As the news concerning Jesus and his work spreads, Herod heard about Jesus and his miracles. Herod ruled over about a fourth of the Palestine, including Galilee and Perna. Let me stop here. When you hear Herod, right, this is Herod Antipas, okay? This is Herod the Great's father. You remember Herod the Great, right? Herod the Great was the guy who was looking to kill Jesus when he was born. Why? Well, remember, Jesus was born a king. This threatened Herod's kingdom, that if he was to continue to be king, that he would seek out and kill Jesus. This is what they went around doing, is they were looking for two-year-olds a certain age, and he said what? He ordered the edict to, to kill and have the, the baby slain. He's a baby killer. That's Herod the Great. This is his son. Matthew 14, 6 says, On Herod's birthday, the daughter of Herodias danced for the guests and pleased Herod so much that he promised with an oath to give her whatever she asked. Promised by her mo- prompted by her mother, she said, Give me the head of John the Baptist. Remember, folks, John's in prison at this point. He sent out word and asked Jesus, If he's the Messiah, the last interaction, folks, we see is Jesus' response to the disciples in 11, 4 through 6, with him pointing to the miracles of Christ and thus confirming that Jesus Christ is the Messiah. But that's it. No other word. We don't know if John ever received that. There's no mention that that the disciples ever delivered that message. The Bible is silent whether John received or that confirmation and so he sits knowing that his fate is just moments away arrested for speaking out against Herod wondering was all of it in vain did i do all of this in vain is jesus who he says he is did i get something wrong the story concerning john was coming to a close. And meanwhile, back in the halls of the great banquet, the Bible says in Matthew 14, 9, that the king was distressed because of the oath of his dinner guests. He had ordered the request to be granted and John beheaded in prison. How's that for shaken? Now caught in the trap and with the honor at stake and his word on the line, Herod orders that his request be granted. Still wondering how he's arrived at this point, John recalls his life. It would have been natural for John to have spent a couple months in prison, removed from the public spotlight. You see, the people loved John, so did Herod. That's why John and and Herod's relationship, John was intrigued by Herod. He thought John was Jesus reincarnated. That from all the miracles that had come from Herod's ears about Jesus, that this man was reincarnated Christ. Herod's belief is the possibility of the resurrection was undoubtedly based on a pharisaic doctrine. But was most likely intermingled with various superstitions. 
In other words, Herod didn't kill John right away for calling him out because of what he'd said. That's Mark's account, if you read the, the book of Mark. Herod was greatly perplexed. He wasn't sure what to do with John exactly. What were John's final thoughts, I wonder? Have you ever considered that as you read this story? If you're sitting in prison and you're recalling your life and you're thinking, did I get it right? What might John's last thoughts be? Here's the forerunner for Christ, imprisoned and then beheaded. Verse 11 says, his head was brought on a platter and given to the girl who carried it off to her mother. And John's disciples came and took the body and buried it. Then they went and told Jesus, I doubt any one of us is ever going to be faced with any kind of situation like that. Not likely. But what I can tell you is that when our expectations don't line up with God's plan for our lives, this can become a challenge for some of us. Most of us have plans and dreams of accomplishing great things in our lives. Some of us are actually living right now in the middle of those plans, aren't we? That we have expectations. Still, some of us are going through trials where our expectations for our life have been turned upside down, haven't we? So what's the takeaway from all of this? What's the lesson that we should follow? What's my, as I like to call it, my homiletical proposition? What do you do with what I've just told you? Trust God, no matter what. I know sometimes that our lives can be a little bit shaky. I know sometimes that we can go through challenges, ups and downs. Trust God, no matter what. This, my friends, takes a lifetime to do. This, my friends, is not easy. Then again, whoever said that the Christian walk was easy. We're not promised anything easy in this life, friends. We're not promised health and wealth. That's the prosperity gospel. We don't teach that here. This is the gospel of Jesus Christ, where Jesus tells us that if they persecuted me, they're going to persecute you. You can expect it. But friends, I can tell you that while I know that our struggles can be a bit of a, a, a problem, be a bit of a challenge at times, I can tell you that what comes after in eternity for those that know Christ worth it. It's absolutely worth it. When we suffered and struggled and hurt and we've been challenged and pushed away, when our expectations to be rich and successful and accepted and loved and our world is falling apart, You see, some of us have expectations, don't we? Some of us have expectations that our lives are supposed to be great. And then God steps in sometimes and he rearranges our schedules. And it's not always easy. The Christian life is not for everyone. You've heard me say that before. But what I can tell you, what comes later is cannot be described, that heaven is a real place. As the Bible says in Revelation 21, he will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death, no more crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. He who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. Can you just close your eyes and just see it? All of the stuff that you have gone through, all of the challenges, all of the hurt that you have, have had to endure your entire life, gone. These are the promises of God. This is what he's telling you. That I'm making everything new. And then he said, write this down, John. For these words are trustworthy and true. Folks, I know what it's like to have expectations that don't align with what we hope. Hang in there. Trust God and the plans that he has for your life. His plans may be 
rocky at times, yes. But you can trust him with your life. Whatever happened to you, Roy? Roy Hobb shifts in, his, play, in his, his seat and says, well, my life didn't turn out as I expected it. Friends, if you have expectations, I understand. I understand completely if you're going through something that is a challenge for you. What I can tell you is to trust God with your entire life. You won't be disappointed. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this message and thank you for your truth. Lord, you provide opportunities on a regular basis for us to trust you. And while I know that those challenges and those trials are extremely daunting, where you stretch us and ask us to trust you is really, really difficult. So, Father, I ask that you're just patient with us as we try to do our very best, not necessarily to understand, but to be obedient to what you call us to do. Father, I am grateful for this church. I am grateful for some of our guests that have shown up today. Uh, I, I, I'm just overwhelmed, and I, I'm thankful for that. And Lord, I ask this week that when you provide those challenges for us, that you give us the strength to walk through them, that you are there with us in the midst of our struggles and our sufferings. And I ask you to bless this church. In your son's name, in the name of Christ, I pray. Amen. Uh, I'm going to have the band come up, and today is a special day for those that, have, that are joining us. Um, we're going to have communion. Um, today is a, a day that we do the first Sunday of every month where we have time with God where we can, we can kind of reset. Um, this is something that we started a while ago so that we really can, could just spend time searching our hearts um, and asking God to forgive us. And so I'd ask that you join us today with communion. Um, first, before we do that, I'd like to do an altar, altar, ugh, can't even talk, altar call. So if you have something that you want to lay down, if you have something that you need to be prayed over, if you have something that you've been struggling with, uh, we certainly have individuals in this church. We are a praying church. I'd be happy to pray for you. I know the elders would be happy to pray for you. Elizabeth would be happy to pray for you. Um, we're just going to go ahead and just lay it down. So if you guys have something that you want us to pray over, come see us.
Lord Jesus. I bow before you in humility and ask that you examine my heart. Show me anything that is unpleasing to you. I ask that you reveal any secret pride that I may be holding on to, any unconfessed sin, any rebellion. And I know, Lord, that you're, you're able to forgive. And because I'm a beloved child, you promise, Lord, that you will forgive if I come to you and I confess my sins. Father, I know that I am not perfect. Far from it. And I just ask that as I lay these requests at your feet, that not only do you, you hear them because I am ready to do business with you, I just need to be reminded from time to time that, that I, I'm, I'm a sinner saved by grace. And Father, you are like the prodigal son, excited when we recognize where we missed the mark, that we bring our requests to you and that we have that relationship uh, because of your son, through your spirit. And we ask that our sins be forgiven. But while my relationship is secure in you, I know that sin can, can break our fellowship at times and, and I'm still human. And I often forget who I am and whose I am. You want to convict and correct me, not to shame me. You love me like a perfect, perfect parent. You'll never disown me nor leave me. And so, Father, I confess my shortcomings to you today. And before I take communion, I'm asking you to truly search my heart and reveal anything hidden to which I ask for your forgiveness. And each time I take communion, Lord, I want to recommit my life, my heart, my thoughts, and, and everything to you. Fill me today with your powerful spirit and forgive, us, and forgive me of my trespasses. I want you to take a couple minutes now and everyone, this is a personal time that you can spend with Christ. Ask for your sins to be forgiven. And as we're doing that, we're going to go ahead and start dismissing Rose to come up.
to consider the importance of communion. I'm going to make a statement that I want you to remember. There's no sin that you have committed that will not be forgiven. If you have something on your heart, you have something that you're not happy about something that you've done that you think for just a second it won't be forgiven. You're wrong. That is to say that you could screw it up and you can't. And Lord Jesus, on the night that he was to be betrayed, he took the bread and 
and he'd given thanks, he broke it, he said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's eat. And the scriptures say that in the same way, after the supper, he took the cup saying, this cup is the new covenant of my blood, which has been poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink of it, drink of it in remembrance of me. Let's drink. Father God, there is no sin that cannot be forgiven. And Lord, we ask that this be the day that we recommit ourselves to you, that what we prayed privately to you might be answered, that as we go to you and seek forgiveness, that you are renewing us every single time, that we can rely on your truth that is found in your holy scriptures, that our expectation that we shall be forgiven is true. And so, Father, I ask that uh, the individuals that are joining us on Facebook Live and those that are here with us in person, that we may go out this week knowing that our sins have been forgiven, Lord, and that we have opportunities to forgive others because we ourselves have been forgiven. Help us to do that, Lord. We ask this in your name, in the name of Christ, I pray. Amen. Ew. It's been one of those days. Oh, no, come on up. <laughs> yeah, come on up. <laughs> Um, at this time, um, we're going to have an offering. If you're watching us online and you would like to make a gift, an offering to our church, please do so by um, jumping over to our website for that. Um, we just had communion, and it's a time for prayer. And I just wanted to invite those that are online. If you need prayer, um, please reach out. Pastor Nate is available. Um, you can send him an email, myself an email. I just want to encourage you. We are here for you, and um, we want to be able to pray with you together. So right now, I'm going to go ahead and pray over the offering. Yeah. And then we'll have a song. Father God, Lord, we just want to give our best to you, Lord. And Father, right now, we are just honoring you with our, our gift, Lord God, and I just pray that you bless those that are giving, Lord God, and continue to use this church, Lord. Continue to help us to spread your word, Lord. And God, we just love you. In Jesus' name, amen.
praise, thank you, praise team. Go ahead and have a seat. So just a, a few announcements. I wanted to make sure those online are uh, finding out what's going on here at CCF. I just want to highlight a few things. We are starting a missions committee. If you are interested in serving on that, please let me know. So what that means is uh, we will get together um, and we will talk about different missions. We will uh, be praying through the missions and then we're going to present those missions to the elders so that the church is giving to um, certain missions that the church body wants to be uh, giving to. There's so many great missions out there. So um, if you have a heart for missions, this is a great place for you to serve. So just let me know about that. Um, we have a local mission right now that we are doing every month. Brenda is in charge of that. And for this month, we are collecting food for the food bank, and they are asking for dry cereal. So Cheerios, checks, Fruit Loops, you know, bring them in. Um, and Brenda will make sure that our food bank gets that. So for the month of March, we're looking for dry cereal. Um, today, after, surf, if, after service, if you are new to CCF, just want to invite you to join us for lunch. Uh, you get to meet Pastor Nate, ask questions, learn a little bit more about church. So I just want to encourage you to stay after service. We will be having lunch for you for that. And then Easter, Pastor Nate was just talking about Easter. Uh, we are having two services this year. So take a look at the slide for Easter. Um, you actually are getting an email right now as we speak about our Easter service that you can click on that link to reserve your seat. We will have service at 9 a.m. and 1045. So just want to make sure you guys are all, all know about that. And Kemper has some special announcements for our youth. Our fabulous youth. Woohoo! morning everybody um, and Facebook family there's two announcements I have to make the first one in revolves is the paintball at Pevs we are now roughly just shy of 20 people we need more people to sign up the more we have the better off it's going to be the more fun we're going to have um, with that being said if we do not hit 25 we will lose an hour so please parents kids friends family sign up anybody can come 10 and above with parents permission of course on the next one is strictly for the youth geared is the March 31st I will be hosting here on Wednesday night the Easter service for the youth with that said it is geared towards the youth but moms dads friends and family please come and attend from 6 30 to 8 the youth band will be singing for us and I will be having some special uh, items on stage that you will learn about and what they have to do with the resurrection of Jesus Christ and with that said I will be closing us out in prayer um, Lord, we come to you today. Today is no different than any other day, except that today is your day is like always, Lord. And we ask that you be with us, guide us, protect us, give us the strength, the wisdom, and the fortitude to carry on through this troubled times, Lord. With your strength, nothing is impossible. We ask that those who have ailments, those who need prayer, who need your love, Lord, more than now, now than ever, please be with them. And as we leave today and go into this world, Lord, that we are a beacon of hope for those who can not see you so they can see you through us, Lord. We ask all these things in your name. Amen. And have a nice week, Facebook.